Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll try to follow the, the kind of format that's been laid out for us. Um, first of all, by introducing ourselves briefly. Now I'll try to keep it to two, three minutes. But I'll, I'll come back with a few follow-up questions by way of introduction. But we will spend most of the time uh, trying to uh, hear from your questions. And if you know that needs some further stimulation from some of us, we'll, we'll do it that way. So. Uh, my name is Matt Terrell. I am not an alum. I came to the University of Chicago as a new faculty member in the middle of 2011 with the responsibility for creating the first ever engineering program at the University of Chicago. Uh, just to go back a little bit, or maybe a lot, <laughs> I'm trained as a chemical engineer at Northwestern originally, and then went to the University of Massachusetts for graduate school, worked for 20 some years at the University of Minnesota, uh, before becoming Dean of Engineering at UC Santa Barbara, which I did for 10 years. And then I was uh, briefly between Santa Barbara and here, uh, Chair of the Bioengineering Department at UC Berkeley. So I have background in uh, chemistry, chemical engineering, material science, especially as applied to uh, biomedical and, and related stuff. Um, my name is Robert Greider. Uh, I graduated in 2010 with a computer science degree. Um, I've had a relatively short career as I've been out two and a half years. Um, so I spent, I spent uh, my first year after graduation doing something not math, science, and technology related, um, working in a campus ministry. And then I've spent the last year and a half at um, Sitter City Incorporated, which is where I work now as a senior software engineer. Um, and I'm Karen Tam, and I graduated from a college in 2006, and I was a pre-med, a human development major. Um, I started out my career in a healthcare consulting firm, helping hospitals with strategy and operations um, consulting, and then moved on to graduate school at the University of Michigan for my MBA and MPP. Um, and then from now, uh, well, at this point in my career, I'm actually working for a think tank slash um, research firm in DC, um, also helping us go international with our products. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Aaron Ackerman. Uh, I work for Apple in California. Um, and I'm happy to be here, although um, I don't know if, uh, there, there, I've met more math and science majors today, more, more, you know, more of you guys here in the audience than I met I think my entire undergrad career. Um, so I'm a little uh, intimidated by your questions. I, I work in, in the design world. Um, and I was originally a fundamentals major here uh, at Chicago way back when. So I'm happy to, you know, from what I've seen from the people I've talked to at lunch, uh, so many of you guys are super focused and super clear about what you want to do within math or science. Maybe some little questions here, maybe which graduate program you want to go to, but that's about the extent of it for some of you. But there are others of you out there I know who, who are here and maybe you're not sure why and, and maybe you're sort of interested in this or maybe you've changed your mind a couple of times already. And I, I'd be happy to answer questions for those of you who don't know exactly what you want to do yet because uh, I've had kind of a, a strange path to where I am today. I'm Tom Kowalarczyk. I graduated in 1987 and then I taught high school for two years. After that I moved to Fermilab. I've been working there ever since uh, except for a one-year sabbatical when I went back to teaching high school. Uh, the group I'm in at Fermilab right now is responsible for the infrastructure that lets the high-energy physics experiments get their physics done. I am Albert Green. Uh, it's interesting because uh, Tom and I, I guess, sat next to each other uh, in E&M uh, way back when. Uh, so uh, uh, I graduated in 87 uh, here with a bachelor's degree in physics. Uh, and then I did a PhD in physics from Stanford uh, University. I am uh, chief executive officer of a company called Kent Displays in Kent, Ohio. Hi, my name is Doug Yao. I finished my bachelor's in biological sciences at the university at uh, 2000. Did a PhD in uh, UIC from farm pharmacology as well as came back here to do my fellowship in pulmonary uh, back in 2006. From then, uh, after 10 years of clinical science research, I chose an alternative career going into the pharmaceutical industry, working at Sanofi Aventis in their hematology division, working as a field medical science liaison, where I currently manage uh, all, the, all the clinical trial interactions and also uh, product and uh, um, interaction, uh, training interactions in all of Illinois and Wisconsin right now. 
And on the side note, I do a lot of um, scientific advising as well as investing uh, with an uh, angel group as well. So I'll be happy to talk to some on, on that note as well. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, just a little bit by way of a little bit deeper introduction. Uh, I, how about, uh, again, keeping it to two or three minutes? What's a typical day at work like for you? I think saying that our positions and our companies doesn't really tell the whole story. I mean, what creative activity do you uh, do at work and, uh, at, you know, how, how does that play out in your typical work day? Please. <laughs> um, so the, I work in a pretty typical office environment. Um, I get to work somewhere around 8 in the morning. Um, aside from meetings sometimes, uh, most of my time is spent actually programming. Um, so I'm working now on an iPhone application programming in um, Objective-C. Uh, I have also occasionally develop in other languages at work, but that's mostly what I focus on now. And um, so my job is to make software go. Um, I, uh, I work for a company that practices um, test-driven development, so I'll write a test for my software and then um, write code that will make it pass. And my whole day is kind of spent doing that, creating small things and bigger things and bigger things on top of that, creating components and um, so forth that help to power an iPhone application and other um, software that we have with websites and so forth. So. Um, my day to day, um, it looks different every day, but um, there's three groups of people that I really serve. One is my executive team, the other is our sales team abroad, and then finally my clients abroad. So who I work with is normally hospital executives across, and that includes health boards, or um, it could be just an, an, a hospital entity um, across the world. But basically, um, my job is to listen to what data top of mind issues they have, whether it's a CEO, CFO, CMO, CNO of these um, organizations, um, and figure out what are their pain points, and then come to the table to my internal executive team and let them know what products um, that we can develop on our end um, as on a service delivery level um, and basically create a new product that is consist consistently pushing our teams um, who are the boots on the ground um, to be helping health system be more efficient and also deliver quality care across the world. All right, so my day starts in San Francisco. Uh, my wife and I live in San Francisco, and, and Apple's about 50 miles south. So first part of the day is a, a Apple bus ride down to work. We have our own uh, fleet of buses, which take those of us who live in, in the city down to work, which is great. Um, and then I, I at Apple, uh, it's, a, it's a big company, as you can imagine, but um, I, I work within the marketing communications group there. And so what we do is we um, tell the story of, of Apple's products to the world. And we do that through um, this pretty big in-house design team that I'm a part of. Um, marketing communications at, both, at most companies, um, if you don't know, is, is usually a small group of people that manage a web design company and an ad agency and a bunch of different agencies. Apple does it all in-house um, because we're crazy about confidentiality, um, mostly. Um, but also because we want to make sure that all those groups are working together. So I've uh, managed big product launches, like the first iPhone and the first iPad. Um, but what I do specifically now is I manage the packaging design team. So we designed Apple's, all the boxes, all the boxes you save in your garage for, for no good reason, um, but, are, but are so nicely made that you can't, can't bear to throw it out. Um, <laughs> that's hopefully, that's, that's what my team does. And, and so what I do within that is um, I manage a team of designers. We got about a dozen designers and um, we do different projects all the time. Uh, but we work directly with the industrial design team as they're developing products um, to figure out how to protect and present them to the world through, through the packaging. And so uh, I spend most of my days in meetings, which I think sounds like a terrible idea or sounds like, like you know, a horrible existence, but it's actually how things get done at Apple. We, we as you know, kind of do everything. We design products, we make them, uh, and then market them. And so we all get together throughout the day in various meetings to solve problems. And um, so I'm often working with designers, uh, and I'm often working with engineers, and we're often working on stuff, you know, a year or two years out at Apple. So it's, it's super exciting, um, and that's a given day for me. Do you give PowerPoint presentations to one another? 
No, I'm, very I'm rarely, yeah. <laughs> I just finished reading Steve Jobs' bio, uh, biography. Yeah, yeah, no, there's not a lot of formal presentations, <laughs> <Yeah>. no. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, at Fermilab, we're a high-energy physics complex, so we have actually three accelerators, and they boost the particles to higher and higher energy. And eventually, those particles have to come out of the accelerator, and we smack them into a target and see what comes out of that. The group that I'm in is called the External Beams Group, and we're in charge of the infrastructure that takes the particles from the accelerator to the target, and then sometimes also from the target to the experimental apparatus. Uh, we're considered an operational group. That means that after we get this equipment designed and installed, we're also, we also have line responsibility for maintaining it. So the first thing I do when I get to work is I read my email, I read the electronic log books, and I see if anything's broken. And if it is, I get it fixed. And then after that, it's time for fun, which is design work and working with the, uh, the scientists there to figure out how to improve the experiments or to figure out what sort of equipment we need for better measurements of the proton beams or how to make their experiments work better. Thank you. Uh, so, I, so I run a, uh, a tech company. And I would say there isn't a typical yeah. day. <laughs> there is not a typical day. Yeah. Um, what I, um, I think if I look back at um, what my career sort of built up to, and it's really um, managing of innovation-based businesses. That's kind of what I do, and that's what I think I do pretty well. Um, I think in a typical day, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time uh, doing deals. That takes that uh, negotiations, um, sort of goes in spurts. There's a lot of that that goes on. Uh, the other bullet point I would say is that um, you know there's there's both good and bad in running a company. I mean the good the I'll start with the bad. <laughs> the bad is that um, you know typically um, you know uh, you know problem stuff happens. I mean and you know there are decisions that are made and and, and typically um, the higher you go in the food chain the you know, the, the, all the easy problems get solved, mm -hmm. and you end up with choosing between disaster and catastrophe. <laughs> and and that, that, that can kind of skew things a little bit, so I'd say that. The second thing I would say is that the good news is it's immensely satisfying um, to have the ability to impact um, a company or a technology or a business area, um, uh, and you can do that um, certainly running a company. Um, just, just like you, my day is very varied just because uh, I work as a field liaison. So I, my, I have a home office and most of my work is done virtually with my team members scattered across the nation. Uh, typically, I think my job comes into three parts. One is client interaction. So I go out to the field, talk to physicians, nurses, pharmacists, looking at how do they use our product, how do they treat a specific disease that we, are, uh, we have products in, and how do we make things better? How do we make their lives easier? How do we get the research done faster? Um, and that's getting insights as well as sharing with them the latest and greatest from the uh, field of knowledge that we have. Two, we do a lot of uh, clinical question answering. So anytime, anytime there is a question that comes out from any clinic that's in my area, uh, that is off-label, meaning that it's not FDA-indicated um, approach, but has been published somewhere in the literature space, uh, those questions come to me, and I'm the one responsible to share with them how has this been done and give them the literature that's supporting that, and just to have the physician have the most information available to make an informed decision whether or not to choose to use this product off-label. Uh, so I do a lot of training on that respect. And then thirdly, uh, as you progress through any type of pharmaceutical company, you get experience in working with strategy. So I'm right now I'm one of the product leads for one of our hematology uh, items. And so I do a lot of work with my medical director looking at what are the data gaps within the science, how do we address those data gaps, and what type of research do we need to fund and provide grants to so that we can answer those, uh, those questions uh, in, in our, that's addressing us right now. Good, thanks. I want to ask one more type of question, and we, I won't go, you know, we don't have to go everybody here, but I, I think one of the other things we want to accomplish here is connecting uh, eventual career um, or post-graduation experiences to the experiences you're having now uh, in your uh, days as undergraduates. So I, I'd like to ask if anybody wants to say anything particular about um, experiences, everybody seems to like what they're doing, so experiences that set you up for success in, in what you're doing now, or things looking back that you really 
uh, wish you would have in your toolkit uh, professionally that maybe you could have taken advantage of here but didn't? If, if, like I said, we don't have to go right down the row, but if there are uh, things that uh, occur to you, uh, I, I think people would be happy to hear them. I'll, 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 I'll say a couple things. So I would say uh, a, few, a few points. The first thing is I think uh, you have a great education here. Um, uh, and I think the most important thing that you get is out of this is learning how to think. I mean, um, and learning how to think, particularly in the sciences, I think uh, the key thing is that you can, you think very analytically and you, you end up with really good problem solving skills. And I think that, those are really, really important skills which I feel for my career started uh, in, in the days I was, it was called the Common Core. I don't know what they call it now, but but uh, the the you know the breadth of courses that you took that was really important. In fact, I would say that was the single most important thing was not just taking physics classes, but taking social science and music and art and so on and so forth. That, that's one thing I would say. The second point I would make is um, that um, one of the things that that you that I've heard a lot is uh, during the course of the of the people talking, talking to students is that, you know, there, there is a real focus on, you know, what is my major and what am I going to do with that major? And I think that that's valid. That's really important to talk about that. But, but I think that there's a whole other side of, of what you end up doing with your career and, and, and really life experience and how that ultimately really dominates. I mean, and if you look at, I think, uh, you know, David Axelrod, who spoke today, if you read, you know, you read his bio right here and uh, you know, I just at does anyone know what he majored in at Chicago? I don't think he's, I think he may have said, but no one, and if you read his bio, there's not a single thing in here that talks about what he majored in. You know, I mean, and that, that's, in fact, if you flip through a lot of these of the alum, alumnus, or alumni, it's just not there. And that's really an important thing to note. I mean, and what I, I think the message is that the specific thing that you choose to major in is is really not the dominating thing. It doesn't define you. It, it, it really yeah. doesn't. It, it's, yeah. it's, it, it starts you off, but it's not the thing that, that really defines you. And I think yeah. what really defines you is, is this learning how to think critically, learning how to think. Uh, and those sort of things. So that's that's yeah. that's what I would. Yeah, would just say. just to add to that, I think I think also a lot of what you're learning is about yourself and about what you like, and and not just what your major is, but but how you like to work. You know, do you prefer to work by yourself, or do you really like those group projects? Are you a natural leader? Are are you someone who who you know wants to just be by yourself and do the do the analysis yourself? Um, and that, that kind of stuff is really, really important too for your career, for your, for your life overall. And I think people often underestimate that. And I think they also, off, often overlook what they're spending their time outside of their coursework doing. You know, some of your, your, the clubs you're doing or the, the events you're organizing um, are just as important as, as the coursework you're doing, the, the major you're, you're spending all your time on, the, the thesis you're thinking about, or, or even the internships you have this summer. Um, so pay attention to those too and, and, and learn from those and, and make sure you do them. I think, I think at Chicago the, the tendency is to, to, to focus everything on, on that major and then when you're not doing that, focus on getting an internship and there's so many other things you can be doing too. Yeah, and I, I really think that's exactly how I played out in my own time at the university. Um, and I think even during times that I didn't think the core was um, important, even though, yes, I knew the message of the analytical skills was important and everything, um, I was much more focused on my pre-med experience because I was so set on being a doctor. But I think um, my international study abroad ended up playing a huge role because that eventually paved a way for me to be in grad school and I started working for um, GE Healthcare in Bangladesh and asked to go to Rwanda and asked to go to Bangladesh and really having opportunities that a lot of people, um, unless they get that foot in the door, and I think that's the point that most of people here are making, is how to get that foot in the door. And a lot of the times it's really because you've graduated with an econ degree or a, a you know human development degree that while it picks someone's interest um, <coughs> they're more interested in the skill sets that you've acquired so I think it's really important to kind of focus on the extracurricular activities um, what role are you playing in these um, clubs and um, you know in my own experience for 
um, um, being president of the pre-med society, that gave me exposure to how to manage people, how to motivate people. And those things, um, I feel like is the best time for you to be experimenting too, your own style of leadership, how do you work in a team. And it's very safe compared to what um, most of us will experience after you graduate, where no one's really evaluating your performance. Everything's self-driven. You might get into conflicts with your peers, but that's probably at a very low risk level as compared to when you get into conflicts in a business situation. Yeah. Go ahead, but, but, but before you, you say something, I just prepare for your own questions because I want to move from us to you yeah. it, it, very soon. So, uh, Yeah, I want to say, uh, particularly being somewhat early on in my career, I feel like the ability to learn and to teach myself that I got at the UFC was really value is was and is really valuable. Um, I think in the first few years of your career or trying to figure out what your career is, you'll probably learn a bunch of different things, some of which you'll never end up using. Mm -hmm. But your ability to learn those things and to transition from, okay, I know this and now my company wants me to learn this and then maybe down the road they want me to learn this other thing makes you a really valuable asset to your employer and it's a really valuable asset to you as well because you have the ability to do that. So let's open it up, please. I, I think it would be good if we use the microphone. Thanks. Right there. Uh, howdy. Um, well, I, I also sit next to someone in uh, any and every day, and this guy has lived and breathed physics since he was eight years old. He knows that he wants to be a physicist, but you know, I'm, I'm not really so certain. So my question is, and I think that we have, think it all of you like doing what you do, it appears. So uh, when did you know that that's what you wanted to do with your life? Be a physicist, you mean? No. <laughs> oh, or, or just, just what whatever you're doing. Whatever doing. Or whatever you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, I, I kind of knew early on, but then I changed my mind. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, went, I went into college knowing that I wanted to teach high school, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to teach physics or chemistry because they both seemed pretty neat. Uh, at that time, physics majors were encouraged to take chemistry, and chemistry majors were encouraged to take physics, at least the first year. So I figured, well, I'll take chemistry my first year, physics my second year, then decide my third year, right? Postpone the decision. Um, I ended up, you know, majoring in physics, and then I taught high school for two years after I graduated. And I really liked it, but I was also working on degrees in education and physics because I liked them both. But I thought, well, you know, I've tried education for a while, let me try physics. So I went to Fermilab and I really enjoyed it. Now I didn't even start out doing, doing physics at Fermilab to begin with. I got hired in as an operator, which was considered a half level above a technician. We ran the equipment, uh, we worked shift. Uh, if something broke, we went out and we tried to fix it. If we made it even worse, we would call the technicians who really knew how to fix it. <laughs> and at the same time, I finished up my, my graduate degree because yeah, I really started to like physics. So it, it was evolving, and it was learning more and more that I like doing this. And part of, it was, uh, part of it was an economic decision, not a monetary decision, but an economic decision. I like doing physics, so I'm going to put more effort into this. I'm going to put more of my resources into this. The trade-off, of course, was you know, working full-time, going to graduate school part-time, you just can't do two graduate programs. And I let the education program drop. You know, but again, that was a choice, and it got more refined, more refined. Um, right now, it's gotten to the point where I'm starting to go into a management position, and um, I'm trying to figure out how to enjoy that. <laughs> and um, quite frankly, maybe you know, if I come back in two years and you ask me how's that management position going, I'll tell you I didn't like it, and I'm not doing it anymore. Or I might say, you know, I found something about it that I really enjoy. But I think the key was always not making the best decision, because then you're never going to make a decision, but yeah. at least trying to make sure that you don't make something that cuts off your opportunities. Mm -hmm. and just keep going forward, you know, like mm -hmm. people have said. I mean, mm -hmm. Intellectually, you've all got it. It's just figuring out what you want to do with it. So, you know, do something that you think you enjoy, keep going with it. Yeah, making, making those decisions are, are tough. I mean, I think we all had have the... Um, amazing privilege of being able to do lots of different things with our careers like to even have a, a seminar like this or spend a whole day thinking about this you know most places in the world 
this, these kind of questions don't come up. You're, you're going to run the shop that your parents run, or you're going to work in the factory that everyone in the town works in. We can do whatever we want, and that can be terrifying. <laughs> you know, and you see it on a lot of your, your friends' faces. You're going through this day, and you're like, I, I don't have an answer. He seems to know what he wants to do. She seems to know, but I don't know. I, it's, and that's, that's tough. And I, I can't speak for everyone. You've been at Fermi a long time, but I think most of us don't know what our careers are, or, or we're figuring it out as we go, or we've had five different careers since we've started. You know, we, we've all done a lot of different things, and that, that's what's fun about it. You know, you're not going to go through this day and then do this again next year and then have a couple more internships and then figure it out and do that for the rest of your life. Some of you may. And actually, I may be speaking out of turn because I think in the sciences, that can happen more often than, than in, in the world I'm most familiar with. But for me, I studied philosophy and English because I loved it. I talked my way into a consulting job in New York. <laughs> I did strategy consulting for a couple of years. Didn't love it, but I did lots of different projects for different uh, kinds of clients. Realized I hated most of the industries that I that I was being exposed to, so that was great. Sometimes, like the best jobs are ones where you do it for a little bit, you learn you don't ever want to do that again, and you cross that off your list. And then I got into design because that's what I was thinking about all the time, and that's that's what I was interested in, and that took me to business school. And I never thought I'd go to business school. I mean. You know, business school for me as an undergrad was the place to sneak into to get good food because they just always had like food around, <laughs> right? And and I think for for me though that ended up being the right decision. And I and you make one decision at a time. And looking back, we can connect the dots and it kind of makes sense. We all seem really happy, but um, but along the way, we're, you're making decisions all the time and you're you're making them one at a time. I would say when I was sitting in E and M next to this guy. Um, you know, I, what I, I knew that I um, liked physics a lot, um, uh, and uh, you know, it's hard when you're undergrad. What does it mean? What is what does that mean? What are you going to do or whatever? And then I went, and then in then, which was the mid '80s, you know, it, there wasn't this taking the next step and stuff. It was pretty much you go and then you go to grad school or or something like that or business, <laughs> you know, and so. I did, you know, I knew I really liked physics, so I went into to grad school in physics, um, and I really liked the subject. Um, but what I realized right away was that I wasn't going to do this academia thing. I was just, no, I wasn't going to do that. And um, and then it I was that, then story. it was into the <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's just like, like that. but then it, then it was into the mode that, that you say. I think you you kind of you know you take this circuitous path yeah. path, and you find your way to doing uh, various things. And now that I look back, I mean, I was good at at, at um, organ. I was good at organizing things, and that mm -hmm. kind of led to a whole collection of different things. So, yeah. yeah. Next question. Yeah. Other questions. Hi, and is it okay if I ask something a little bit more on um, my personal experience? Is, is that we okay? have okay. no censorship yeah, yeah. or... No, everything's going to be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think... Is this on? Yeah, it's on. Okay. It's on, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I want to be a chemistry major because I honestly like chemistry. I just, I find wave functions interesting. Good I reason. Mean, <laughs> that's a good reason. And, but I sort of see myself not going into research because, as you said, just there's something about research that I know that I, it's not something that's going to make me uh, very happy. And as I've gone through my head, I have this idea in my head that I can take my chemistry major and be surrounded by people who do science and hear what they have to say and I just, like, I learn all these things that I like, but then somehow be a bridge between what the scientists do and somehow being able to foster them and, and mm -hmm. take the scientists okay. and bring them out into and sell for them and, and, and as a meanwhile, learn from them. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether that exists or where that's just a figment of my imagination. I took an internship in a pharmaceutical mm -hmm. thinking, oh, that's kind of it. And then it turns out that I was just surrounded with people who studied marketing and, and I, they had me doing PowerPoints. Yeah. And I was just like, eh, am I, am I imagining things? Can this happen? And I was wondering if you guys could sort of Either let me know right now with your imagination, <laughs> or I think both Karen and uh, yeah, at least might have something to say. Go ahead, Karen. Sure. Um, yes, it does exist, yeah. and I think the good place is at least what I found for myself is that you actually there's places for people to speak different languages. The business language, like you said, um, you were seeing people surrounded. 
surrounding you that was speaking marketing language. There's a science language. And unfortunately, they don't normally talk together. Um, and you're going to see that as you go up the food chain, um, that more and more that ability to speak multiple languages and understand those perspectives are going to become even more important. But from a practical standpoint, um, I feel like there's often people confuse jobs versus careers also. Um, and from that perspective, you can actually dissect those into two different things. One is a function versus an industry. It sounds like you already know what subject area you really like. But as a function, that's probably another area to explore. Um, so I think um, the way that I like to, I like to think in frameworks. So forgive me if I'm going kind to of trying to draw out a picture while I'm explaining this. But some people love, the, like myself, I love the healthcare industry. What I didn't realize as an undergrad was that I didn't need to be a doctor or be a scientist or land in a pharmaceutical world, for that matter. But I can actually take my healthcare knowledge and go to an investment bank and be able to be an analyst for them. Or I can actually take my financial analysis skill and put them into the airline industry. So I think those, if you kind of think about them um, separately, you'll be probably able to be able to find a place for yourself. And yes, they do exist out there. I'll speak more on that too. So yes, um, from the biological sciences point of view, I had no idea that this, uh, this realm existed when I was an undergrad. Um, and that's how, as you progress through your career and even your graduate training, you talk to people and you, ex and you actually find out there's other alternative careers that you can leverage your scientific skills that may not have existed uh, when you were uh, in, as undergrad. So basically, um, you, as, as like uh, medical science liaisons for pharmaceutical companies, what we do is we take the, our biological knowledge and we leverage that to speak to both the commercial teams as well as the clinicians. And that's the best. When you're like the masters of knowledge and you're the knowledge of people who they depend on to get all the latest uh, findings from the pharmaceutical world, from the academic world, and then you ask them for advice and bring that back to the company saying, how can we use the clinician's knowledge and collaborations with those people to build this brand or to build this um, uh, product that could address these medical needs? And for you, for chemistry, same thing. There, has, there, there are firms that's, that's going to be needing people like you where you have that very strong background in science, but then you're able to think in a strategic standpoint, how do you use that science to help develop a product that can help the world? I would just throw a, a little tiny bit of a curveball in that. Um, and I think, in, in a sense, the physical sciences, chemistry, physics, uh, uh, biology to some extent, um, is, is a little bit different. I think that um, there certainly you can, there's, there are many areas where, there, there's many overlap areas for sure. But what you described, um, which is, uh, um, I'll just say this, it, it really helps you to have credibility if you've been a practicer of the, I mean, I started my career as a research bench scientist. Mm -hmm. um, and that knowledge, you know, in running a tech company where what we do is we've taken really core technology and created products out of it, you can walk into the laboratory and you can discuss things with the technologists mm -hmm. and they listen. And because you've done that, and so I think that depending on the details of what you're talking about, being having done that research um, at some level, I don't want to downplay that because it, it really carries a lot of 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 uh, weight around. So I just want to throw that out there. Are you referring to a PhD class or a master's? Uh, or I, I, Yes and no. I mean, it depends on what specifically you're 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 doing. Um, you know, it depends. It's just being a practicer of it rather than just you know Stupid. being a, yeah. doing it rather than just talking about doing it. Right. Yeah. Other questions. Go ahead, please. So one of the themes that has really stood out to me today is that. You know, as you're developing your career, it's not about necessarily planning 30 years into the future. And you know, David Axelrod was talking about that, but kind of taking opportunities as they come, and um, you know, just grasping at grasping at things as they arrive in the short term, and just all the discussions of various alumni and 
people in various different industries has, have kind of shown that theme. And I'd just like to kind of explore that theme a little bit deeper and ask you, you know, what opportunities were important to you as you were maturing and going through college and, you know, entering, you know, the, the jobs that you're in? Uh, what were the, what were like the kind of micro opportunities that you, you grasped at? Um, what mentality would you like um, advise us to have in order to take advantage of opportunities well? Um, you know, are, are there specific opportunities that we should be taking advantage of at this institution? So this, this sort of might cover, uh, you know, uh, research projects or internships or summer jobs or, or things like yeah, that. Yeah, anything like other that. other things you have in mind. Yeah, just, I mean, and yeah. what are the opportunities that were important to you developing your path? And, you know, what's the right mentality to get into? You know, just th the theme of opportunities, if you could speak to that. Uh, let me say something, and then yeah. Doug. Um, uh, again, I'm, I'm not an alum. I went to a school not too far from here, um, at, which had, at the time that I went there, a really well-developed uh, co-op program, which is sort of the ultimate internship experience. Uh, yeah, and uh, I found that very useful. Um, I worked 18 months for the same company. I grew up in New Jersey, and this, this company was in New Jersey, so I went back and forth. That, that's uh, pr almost the, the ultimate of internship experiences, which I, I also think are very valuable since there was a little bit of put down of academic profession. I, I knew <laughs> after I did that that I never really wanted a real job. I wanted to stay <laughs> in universities and pursue that kind of uh, research and uh, teaching uh, profession. But the, the point is not really what I decided to do. The point is how clarifying those experiences are. Mm -hmm. So, so I think um, one, one thing that I did not know as an undergrad, which I kind of learned as I progressed through grad school and also my career, was you have to be proactive in grasping or creating opportunities because um, the way you develop and find your optimal career is through exploring different projects and taking ownership of those projects wherever it may be and trying to have a story to tell to recruiters, to alumni, to any, to any of your peers of what, is your, what are you passionate about how does all these experiences show you who you are? And for us on the other side of the table, we see that we can translate whatever you've done to whatever projects we have. And perhaps we might want to hire you to, to join our team later on. So that's one of the things I had to do was uh, find opportunities for myself to build different skill sets, which I found was lacking either my education or any of the extracurriculars I was doing. And um, each one of them helped build a certain part of me, which helped me to market myself as a well-rounded scientist or somebody that stood out from the average scientist as I uh, progressed through my career. But I think what might be helpful are some hints about how to find those um, special opportunities. So, so I think um, one of the ones I found, this was actually uh, during my postdoc, actually, the, for grad school, it was actually, um, I, did a re I did research in the laboratory, but I told my boss, which was there, was that I wanted a specific project, and I was willing to work for free to, do, to, to get a project. Um, I didn't want to just be the standard dishwasher, lab tech, gel maker, whatever you want to call them, but I wanted to say, I want to do a little bit of the science, contribute some part to one of your papers, or even get an abstract, because then I can have something to share with the graduate admissions counselor. And that was my first step as I uh, progressed through. And then later on, I found associations or clubs, or even started a club actually at University of Chicago later on, where we looked at alternative careers and we brought in speakers to sh enlighten us as to what other things can we do with a biological sciences career that, I, that is outside of just clinical research or academia. Yeah, I, I think you hit on something good there. Part, part of the word was free. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because anybody who needs help loves to hear that. Um, when, and it, this was later in my career. I said that I started out at Fermilab, you know, a little bit above a technician. And one of our jobs was to keep the particle beam on target. And we did that, you know, with an old controller. You hit the left arrow button or you hit the right arrow button. <laughs> and you do that for eight hours and you go nuts. But, you know, you start doing this and you think, oh, if I hit it twice, it moves over three notches. If I hit it once, it moves over one and a half. Well, that should be something you can automate, right? Well, I got to talking with one of the scientists there, and he said, I had the same idea, but I don't have time to work on that. Okay, so I volunteered to do that. So that was something where I had somebody who would mentor me. It was on my own time. Hey, mm -hmm. it's free, so the lab's not paying for it. It worked. 
Now, even if it had failed, that would have been okay because somebody there, I knew somebody, right? Mm -hmm. I had somebody that mm -hmm. could mentor me. I could somebody, had somebody that I could talk to more about physics. Mm -hmm. They understood that I was interested in this. And then when a staff position opened up, you've got some experience. This person knows you already. But again, it was being yep. proactive mm -hmm. and sometimes you know, putting in a little bit of extra work. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think being being hungry and and volunteering for stuff is you know is is always great. Mentors, you know, great teachers, really important, and that's no different in the workforce. Um, finding a, a job uh, with a great boss versus another place that might be a a better company but not as good of a position with a less good boss. Go with the good boss. You, you'll you know you'll you'll learn more, and that's really really important. I mean, the, your 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 learning doesn't stop when you graduate. The the Internships that you're doing is an extension of, of all of the learning you're doing and those jobs I mean our jobs continue to be huge learning experiences for us But those early jobs are really really important learning opportunities So um, some of the things I think you can do also while you're here to to help prepare for what is different about the work world is um, And and again, I don't work in science or, or math. So this may not be exactly relevant, but for most people, academic, academic work is very individual. For most people, their jobs tend to be much more group oriented, and, and that's often a hard transition for people to make. Um, and so to the extent that you can do group activities and lead groups, and, and, and it can be anything, it can be academic, or it can be just social, or you know whatever it is, um, finding ways to, to get people to, to do things is a really important skill. And, and another one is, is around communication. And again, this may be different in science, but generally, to this point in your lives, you've been writing papers and, and, and doing work for professors who are much, much smarter than you and know the subject a lot more. And you've communicated in a way that, that tries to impress on them how smart you are. All right, and, and you write it very in, in kind of a complicated way. And, and quickly in your careers, you've, you'll often be researching things and quickly become an expert in a part of something that you end up knowing more about than the other people. And you then have to communicate that to other people who know less about it. And, and again, I don't read as many abstracts as you guys do, but I, I, I have seen a ton of bad writing in the world from really, really smart people. And I think to the extent that you can try to undo some of the habits that you've acquired over the years and learn to communicate clearly and, and, and effectively, I think that's going to serve you really, really well no matter what, what field you're going into. So I, I, like, uh, I like Tom's example of the, the, the uh, beam, the moving the beam around. And, and you know, I, I think you, getting people's attention, um, which is kind of what the question you were asking, um, mm -hmm. you know, what would be, it's interesting, that's a good story, but imagine if the guy would have said, that can't be done. Oh, he did. Good. Yeah. That's, Actually, that, my, that, my that, that's, that's, the, that's how you get, that's how you get people's attention. He still owes me a six pack. Because, <laughs> because, no, it's, 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 it's true, because, it because it's, you know, the world, it's, especially as you innovate, I mean, we're technologists, we, you know, we focus on innovation. Mm -hmm. right. And as you innovate, the definition, the answer is by default, no, right. it can't be done. And and getting and getting people's attention, the easiest way to get people's attention is when someone says no and you do it. And you say, Yes, it can be done. See, yeah. here it is. Right. Um, so I actually encourage you to look for opportunities that you know the answer has been no. And you all are really smart. I mean, you all are really smart here. And so look for those. Be fearless. That's the other thing. Be yeah. fearless. Sure. Yeah. And on the flip side of that, you know, not all of us are going to be Nobel laureates, obviously, but obviously we have in our own fields going to be innovators in some point. And I know the word networking can be, you know, viewed as, well, generally has a lot of negativity attached to it, but I'm a big fan of leveraging human capital. Um, and I think I didn't realize that as an undergrad. I thought that, you know, talking to someone, getting someone's like business card is really difficult for me to do even though I was extrovert it's not something that you like how do I write that email like things like that but I think push yourself out of your comfort zones what I encourage you to do is if you're sitting on a plane talk to the person next to you they might be 60 years older than you but guess what they might have a grandson or even um, a son that is working in a field that you're interested in. the point being leverage your family members leverage your friends friends siblings Friend. whatever it is yeah, um, and unfortunately like that's how everything gets done in the you know professional world it's, it's fortunately it's very efficient <laughs> it yeah. is very efficient yeah. Well, yeah. It works. yeah and so Something that didn't exist when we were in school is LinkedIn. I would encourage you to really use 
um, LinkedIn rather than Facebook, because um, from an employer's point of view, that doesn't, and make sure that you're actually taking off pictures from Facebook. That's a very practical thing that I can give you. Um, pictures of partying and things like that. You Chicago, less so, but um, <laughs> I can say it because I was an undergrad here. But um, LinkedIn, seriously, look at the companies that you're interested in, look at people's career paths, start contacting them. Alumni are usually a good place to start. Other questions? Yeah. Please. Yep. Um, I was just wondering if in like job interviews or applications, if there is anything specific about the University of Chicago or your education here that you think really stood out to your employers and that was unique and that you used to like market yourself. Um, from a hi I guess from a hiring perspective, I see a lot of resumes from uh, undergraduates, um, and different schools have particular reputations attached to them. And U Chicago remains um, the analytical think tank um, ish, um, at least for my firm. That's what we look for. Um, writing actually is not so much. We find that U Chicago candidates write very um, convoluted, complex. Yes, great stuff, but guess what, it's not gonna translate into a CEO's desk um, that they can take something right away. Um, and I think, um, you know, so things like um, play up your analytics um, and it really goes back to the brand that you're building for yourself. So outside of academics, I would definitely be showing if you're interested in a career more in the professional world um, and not in the academia uh, world, I would focus a bit more on the professional skill side and demonstrating leadership and teamwork and communication skills. I think one of the things that sets Chicago apart too is the core, right? And, and I think when you're interviewing and, and, and you're going deep into science, you, you might think of that as a disadvantage. You might be up against someone from Stanford or MIT, right, who's been doing what you've been wanting to do, but they had a two-year head start. They've been able to do it uh, for, from the beginning, and all their internships are about that, and you had to waste your time doing SOCH and, and HUME and, and these things that you didn't think were relevant. Um, I, as, as someone who's hired people, and, and I think as uh, for all of us, I think that well round, that more well-rounded uh, candidate from the University of Chicago is a huge, huge asset. And, and it's different for every job, of course, but, but typically you're hiring people, um, especially right out of college, not for a specific set of knowledge or skills that you have. You're hiring people who are really smart and really interested in your field, and, and if they're excited, and, and smart, and they have a, like a, a better, well-rounded education, which I think you can legitimately say coming from Chicago, I think that's, that's definitely to your advantage, and you should, you should play that up. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to say this, but I frankly don't care when people go to school when I, when I heard them, because I, I just, you know, I, I, uh, I, I feel that if you go to a school like Chicago, which is a great school, it comes out. Yeah. And I don't even, or, or, you know, where you're, and I think the, again, I think the big thing about U of C is that you tend to be more balanced. And I think balance is the, to me, that's the most important element of success, balance. Mm -hmm. And so I see, uh, you know, I don't even, in fact, I don't even look where they went to school, but, but it just comes out. And so statistically, I think I'd probably like people from U of C more. <laughs> I kind of have to agree with Al too, because um, as you, if, if you go on professionally in one of the sciences, um, eventually you're going to be looked at based on your last degree, whether like it be five, your, five uh, yeah, five years, because all of us are very well past our last degree, and so you'd be looked at your PhD, your MD, your MBA, and also your fellowships, and where have you worked since then? How does that build yourself? Like, like um, as one of our speakers said, how, how, how do you brand yourself? And so U of C gives you a very good foundation, and that's how you start yourself off, but um, for most of us, we had to get secondary education to increase our credentials so that we are more well uh, versed in our field so that we can make a bigger impact in whichever company we work for. Yeah, I wanna um, just kind of bounce off that point and say technology is very different than that. Um, I, I feel like at least in the technology space where I am, which is um, more startups and smaller companies, yeah. mm -hmm. what you've built and what kind of independent projects you've done have a lot more weight than the degree that you have. Yeah. Um, so there are people out there who are very accomplished and very well respected in the field who maybe don't have 
a prestigious degree, but have done amazing work. Um, so I just want to say, if you're if you're planning to go more into technology, think about how you can get um, your degree doesn't hurt you at all, but think about how you can get some of that experience doing independent projects um, and working to build your skill set. Yeah. So how did you do it? Um, I I didn't. I didn't do a fantastic job of it, honestly. I'm still in the process. Um, so I think uh, I, I did some projects as an undergrad. Um, for my interview, I put on uh, I'm, the technology interview that I did for my current company, I put on there two or three small projects I had done as an undergrad. Um, one of them was implementing an algorithm from a paper um, in C++, I think. Um, and since it was an entry-level job and, you know, they kind of – you know, they asked me to explain it a little bit, and I did. And then, you know, I they, they also do in most programming interviews. You have a pretty basic problem that you solve, so I solved it, and I talked with them for a while. And you know, for it, the qualifications are higher as you kind of move up. But you know, having that experience of having built something yourself is important. I, I think you're right. You know, I just had an experience this week where a University of Chicago undergrad came. He was an economics grad, but. The, one an introduction to a VC firm in New York that I know, and uh, <clears throat> he was willing to work for free, but still there was the question of, you know, what are you actually capable of doing? And he had written a very nice paper about uh, grid parity for solar energy in California that brought out these analytical skills and uh, appealed to this VC firm that's in the clean tech space and uh, mm -hmm. made a difference in yeah. them taking him on. Mm -hmm. cool. More questions. No, it's like a hundred degrees in here. Yeah. But <laughs> hang in there. More questions. Please. Um, so I know that you work in marketing and design, and a lot of you guys are like are into physics, chemistry, etc. Um, what in what ways could you say um, does your work provide you with opportunities to be creative on a day to day? Um, yeah. hmm. That's an easy one. <laughs> so who wants to take it on? Yeah. Kind of have the designer. Come well, on. I, I, I think my answer is easy, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, so it's interesting. Apple is considered a very uh, creative place. I, I work with a team of designers who are some of the most amazing designers in the world. Um, they are unquestionably super creative. Um, but what's interesting is uh, I, my role there is I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm called a producer. Right, and so I'm, I'm in charge of a team. I'm sort of managing what they do and, and, and the overall schedule of things and coordinating with other groups and, and kind of overseeing the design team. I'm not a designer. Um, but I think, I think what I do uh, requires a lot of creativity also. And I think, I think there are tons of roles within Apple that are not purely creative where they, we have some of the most creative people because creativity is about solving problems and, and about looking at something which Said, you know, people say it can't be done or, or, or seems really difficult and figuring out a way to do it. And, it, it, and creativity is about uh, trying things. And it's also about failing a lot and, and coming back and trying again and iterating. And in my world, that's, that means one thing. In science, that means something else. But it's the same principle, right? You're, you're, you're trying things, you're experimenting. Um, and creativity isn't uh, this like flash of lightning and you know, you're just like a creative person. Um, creativity, I think, is, exists in, in many, many fields and um, is something you can get better and better at over time. Including negotiating a deal. Yeah. Where creativity is really important because you get to these points where you know, you're done. You're walking or the other guy's walking and you have to be creative in coming up with the right, you know, solution that, you know, where both sides win because deals are no good if both sides don't win. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's across yeah. the board and a lot of things create, you got to be creative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. One other area that might be on some people's minds and that it's interesting, I, I think, is to talk about how you, uh, we talked about how important balance is and in, I think we were talking about in the uh, educational and professional sense, but what about in a work and social sense? Um, you know, how do you how do you manage uh, a balance between your family and social life and your work life? Um, is it easier or harder to do now that, that you're a regular working professional as opposed to when you were a student? Okay. Anybody who feels like answering that may. Um. I can start. Uh, I got married about six months ago, 
So there's been a lot of uh, different, it's not that I didn't have to balance it before, it's just more uh, upfront now. To balance it more. Yes, balance it more. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, I think it, I, um, it requires a lot of sacrifice and a lot of planning. Um, you've got to be willing to do the dishes and do the laundry and do all that stuff. We and yeah. <laughs> well, I, I know, I know, I'm not there yet. <laughs> Still working on my bachelor's degree in balance. I, <laughs> kids is the masters, I think. So, um, but um, yeah, it's it. You you have to plan. You have to. Um, I think it's definitely more difficult than in college because in college, my social life was my roommate and the people on my floor in the dorm. And now it's like I have to travel 45 minutes to see my friends who live on the other side of town. Um, and that's still awesome, but it's, it just requires more planning and um, a, a, a willingness to uh, be creative and to negotiate and to find ways that you can uh, uh, get work done and have a real life outside of that, too. You know, I, I, th I think this is probably the case for some other people up here, but I think... Um, for some people, they have a job. Uh, for most people, right? They have they have a job, and then they have interests outside of work, hobbies, things that they're into. Um, and I think one of the the great uh, things that, that many of us are enjoying up here, and that you can probably feel from us, is that we are doing things that we love, and we're working with people that we consider friends, and that we love to be around all day long. And that's that's the kind of job you want, right? Because then it's not. Then it's not work. Then it's, I mean, it's work. You know, you wouldn't maybe do and do it if, if you didn't need to be uh, need to be paid and take care of your kids and things like that. But when you're doing something that you're interested in, like really genuinely interested in, and and, and you're surrounded by people that you really like, and and you're socializing at work throughout the day, they aren't these two separate things anymore. You're doing you're you're doing you're living uh, a life that that is more integrated, and I think that. Um, that makes a huge difference. Then you're, you're, I mean, even just in terms of efficiency, <laughs> you're killing two birds with one stone because you're, you're having fun at work and you don't have to make up for it after work with a whole other set of things. And that becomes even more important, I think, when you get married and when you have kids and you have this whole separate work that doesn't integrate. I can't bring my kids to work, right? Uh, that, that wouldn't work. So I, I, I have my life at work, which luckily, like, checks off so many other things for me. It's not just a job. And then I, and then I have my life at home, and, and I'm able to keep those things in balance because I don't have to then spend all weekend uh, on these hobbies because I don't have an outlet for my interests. You know what I mean? I, I would say from, a, from a, I'm going to talk about it from a manager's perspective. And in, in my company, I really preach uh, work-life balance. And, and, I, and it's actually, it's really selfish because the reason is that um, you know employees, particularly key employees, are an investment. I mean, and and if you're 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 in the middle of something, if you have a key employee leave, you got you're in a world of hurt. Mm -hmm. You're in a world of hurt. And 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 you know the thing that the challenge is when you're at a small, kind uh, of fast growing small like tech company, the startup kind of world, you know the, the the people they love what they do. They're and they get and if they do it. Or you know they're doing it all the time, 24/7. They burn out, right. and if they burn out, you know, from a selfish manager's perspective, you're again you're in a world of hurt. So I really think it's important that you balance it. It starts actually when you're in college. I think it's really hard when you're in college um, because you know it's so much you know grades and scores, and it's it's very easy to evaluate yourself. You think based on you know your score, and there's a lot more to it. So I, I really I really think work-life balance is super important. Yeah. And I, just one last little thing. It gets easier, I think, when you're not in school. Like right, right now, I think in the back of your mind, some of you, have, it's hot in here. It's like the end of the day, and you're starting to think about like the homework you kind of should be doing, the reading, you like the problem sets. The, and 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 for mo many of us, I mean, we all work really hard, right? But I think work life is a lot cleaner. The separation, like like when you're in school, you're sort of always on. You always should be studying, or you feel like you always sh like that you should always be doing more schoolwork and I think for work you know we're all we all have our, our phones and we're always like checking things but it is cleaner it is there is more separation um, I'll add one of, uh, last point is that um, I have a unique perspective because I work from the field so I really don't have to check in to the home office at all my manager lives in Dallas but 
that's the luxury of when you get to that point where you find a team where the trust is in you because we have deliverables we have to hand in at you know, monthly, monthly projects, weekly projects, whatever, and you're graded based on that. They don't care how much time you spent on it as long as it's done correctly and well. And when you get to that point where you get those managers which trust you, the work-life balance is very nice because you know, I have a six-month-old at home. I get to spend time with her during the day, which is very unique for, from a lot of parents' perspective. And then I travel, which I have to do, but I target it so that I get the most done in the shortest amount of time I have to be away from home so that I have that nice balance where I come back. But the downside of being at home, working from home, is that your, your day can never end. So right. Right. You, I have to be able to mentally say, at this point, I'm going to turn everything off and that's it. Yep. Unless, of course, I have to finish something where I'm prepping for a meeting or things like that, where then you know turn them back to the computer and when the kids asleep, and you know it's it's just a good, good, a fine balance between how much time do you want to dedicate to make become the best employee that they can be, while not sacrificing your other parts so that you don't get burnt out like everybody's saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I just there's another question too, but but you you you, you may Oops. ask a question. Then. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could provide a moment in your jobs when you just like stood back and, and that moment showed to you that what you were doing was important, just like a specific moment, just because I think it would be helpful to us to kind of see like what, you know, what really goes on and how like the, the meaning behind your jobs. When I walked into, you know, we developed, took a technology from sort of the laboratory to, you know, consumers and when you walk into the store Best Buy or something like that and you see you know I was one of the inventors and to see as a technologist I don't think that for me there was nothing more rewarding than seeing the idea on a store on a store shelf that, wow. that, that was that that's pretty good that was pretty good mm -hmm. I think for me similar to that obviously not a, like a tangible product but being able to um, say that you know Basically, currently my role is helping uh, existing mature business go and butting off into almost a little um, new entrepreneurship endeavor abroad and being able to kind of see that membership grow and that client base grow, I think, is what's rewarding for me. I had a very different one. Um, about five years ago, we were doing an installation project where we were under, we were under the gun to get some shielding put in whatever it was, the details. And there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of pressure to have the people work six tens. So six days a week, 10 hours a day. And they were just getting burned out. And I knew this, I was overseeing the project, and I just had to put my foot down and say, we're just not doing this. We're not doing it. And I knew I was gonna catch a lot of heat. Um, you know, when you're managing a project, it's reflected in your pay. But you know, these guys just couldn't do it. And Near the end of the project, it was the last day, and son of a gun, my daughter's softball team made the play out. She was pitching, and she was, you know, she was catching. And the game started at 4 o'clock, and we were supposed to work until 5 that day. And the guys could tell that I was just upset about this, and one, uh, that I was upset. And they said, what's going on? I said, you know, Abby's catching today, and I'm not going to be able to see her. Well, son of a gun, the task, master, the task manager turned around and told everybody, his daughter's in the playoffs. We're getting this job done by four. We're working through lunch. <laughs> and they did it. <laughs> and I'll tell you, just that feeling that I knew I was doing my job because they were willing to go out to bat for me. And, you know, we've all talked about making those human contacts and the personal relationships. And that's so important because then you really do have a team, you really do have a group of people pulled pull together. I, I think for me was um, probably a few years ago when a physician calls me up and says that he's heard of um, you know, off-label use of one of our drugs, a multiple myeloma, but he's like, he hasn't heard the data, he's not sure what to do. So I walk in, share the data with him, and he utilized that data that I shared to treat a patient. And this was a therapy that he would never have considered, but for some reason he remembered somewhere during one of the conferences somebody mentioned that it has been done. A couple isolated cases, but the results were positive enough for him to consider this as an alternative therapy for his patients. 
And so that's when I figured oh, my job is meaningful. Had I not come in that day to his office to share this information, he would never have considered that alternative treatment. And you know, the, the course of therapy may have been altered. So I think. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think uh, the path in science is often such that once you get um, a degree, you're ushered into graduate school, and then you continue for your PhD. Um, and that's often six or so years of commitment. So I guess what advice would you give to someone who is really interested in the subject that they're doing? So they're considering going to graduate school because they want to learn more about it, but they're unsure about such a huge commitment and putting so much time into something that in the end they might not want to do research but do some research but want to do something more business oriented or, um yeah you're young yeah. six years is not that much to be honest. <laughs> short answer take time off i mean i thought i was going to be a doctor and yeah. but i was like you know med school can wait two years and then by the end of two years like yep it's not the right thing for me I would actually talk to your peers because um, time, waste of time, I, unfortunately, I, for me, I feel like you don't want to waste time because that, that's so precious and you could use, utilize it in multiple ways. And so eventually you want to figure out if you do have a dream career, find people who actually went that road and see how, how they did it. Do they actually need that PhD or the MD to get that route or can, they, can you have alternative ways to build your credentials so that you could do the same route in a shorter amount of time? And I think a little bit of research, and everybody at UFC does that frequently, is do, do what you do best, is research the topic, and then find the best solution. And I, I think the age difference is just shown here also. It, it's six years. I mean, the, it's, well, not, it's not that much. You do it because you want to do it. You don't do it if you don't want to do it. I mean, it's only if you really, because it's hard. It is. If you really feel a passion to do it, you, have, you can only do grad school and a PhD in physical sciences if you really want to do it. Otherwise, it is too hard. Yeah, but and I mean, if you in need the spirit to that I was trying to get to before, I mean, there are really concrete ways of trying that lifestyle out yeah. and living in it, yeah. too. Um, almost all of the science and now the engineering labs at the University of Chicago will open their doors to undergraduates who want to do research in them, either during the academic year or during the summer, or in, in my own case, we, we typically have four or five undergraduates in the lab at any one time, so you can see exactly what it's like uh, to, to be a graduate student. And in, in one case in my lab, we have a person who has pretty much decided that uh, she, well, she has now decided that she wants to go to graduate school, but when this experience started, she knew she wanted to go to graduate school, but she didn't want to do it right away. And uh, she worked, has been working with us for a year in between graduating and going to graduate school, which gives her the time to really, and she's paid, you know. I mean, the good thing about this field academically is that most of the faculty members have money in their labs to pay people. So there's really almost no excuse for not trying it out if you feel like you'd like to. Um, I think the opportunities are abundant, and the, uh, the faculty is willing. I, I just want to um, kind of echo what you said, Karen, about um, just maybe taking time off. Some of this may be my personality, but I feel like even taking a year after school to work, um, kind of what Aaron said, getting out of the bubble of like, I always have this, this thing to do in the back of my mind, and this pressure of like, or for some people, it's pressure of like, I want to look good for my professors or teachers right. and I want to succeed. Like, after you, you're out of school for a year or two, you realize like, wow, it's my life. Yeah. You know, I'm the one giving myself a grade at the end of it, or, you know, if you want to think of it that way. Yeah. But, um, but it's my life, right? And the choices that I make are the ones that I live with. And it's not like the person who's up front and, and dangling the degree in front of me, right? I better want that degree before I go get it. Yeah. Um, and it better be the thing that I want and that's the reason I'm going for it, so. And similar though, similarly the question, yeah. the uh, comment that you know, professors have money. And the, the experiment that I'm working on, we've also had three uh, graduate students go through who did take time off after they were completed their degree. They were hired back in by a university affiliated laboratory as a lab technician or whatever. 
and you know they had known the professor in college. You know, and the, the deal was that you know, they would get paid something, and they'd get to work on the experiment. On the experiment, they'd gain some knowledge, and then after that, they could decide whether they wanted to pursue graduate school or not. Um, that certainly wasn't standard. So again, it comes into you know making these opportunities for yourself. Uh, creative like, solutions like that are always possible also. Yeah, yeah I think the, the only thing I would throw in is I think in the physical sciences, um, it's a little bit tougher taking time off. I think it's because it's a longer road. I think in the professional school, it's you know, fixed. Three years law school, four years right. med school. And I think in like physics, it's six and a half years, five and a half years. And, you know, it can kind of yeah. start pushing out. So I, I, it, that's just something to keep in, keep in mind. Yeah. But I don't know. It's hard to go back. Yeah, exactly. If you, if you don't know for sure, I would wait. And, and a, a year, taking a year off could be hugely valuable. I have, uh, I don't know anyone who's regretted taking a year or two to work. I do have friends who have gotten into PhD programs and realized five, six, seven years later that that's not really what they want to do. And you're kind of screwed. <laughs> I mean, you do, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's right. Yeah. If you do take a year off, keep living like a student. Because yeah, that, that's that's the tough situation. You you get you get used to not being poor, and then you don't want to go back. <laughs> the academic part isn't too bad. Right. Any last questions? Go ahead, and then we'll uh, call it quick. Call it. Go ahead. Use the microphone, thanks. Because we're getting interference from our. From so I think I think something that's probably on a fair amount of our minds, um, and that a lot of you have either lived through or maybe thought about. Um, in academia is how hard is it or what are the advantages and disadvantages of transitioning to maybe a more um, engineering side of things after doing a fairly theoretical um, program, you know, like at the U of C in physics, for example. Um, so how do you approach that as you're graduating, thinking about what kind of graduate program to get into, um, what kind of maybe industry experiences you can try for, or how hard it would be to get one of those? I'm not quite sure I understand the thrust of your question. Are you talking about moving into a, uh, a, a, a information technology or some other kind of technology job from the UFC, or are you talking about going to graduate school in engineering or something? Um, I suppose less information technology and more engineering. In a company or in graduate school? I don't, I, there's um, no problem. I it's, say, oh, it's no problem. It's no problem. Yeah, I, I, no problem. I, I will answer it from a, a different kind of perspective, but I really think, and I've been observing the University of Chicago undergraduates now for 18 months and comparing them to Berkeley undergraduates, the University of Chicago undergraduates are in a very strong position to do almost anything they, they set out to do. And, and, you know, maybe this is a good closing remark that, that I'll make, you know, that I, I think there have been several main themes here. Well, this is nominally a math, science, and technology uh, session, but uh, I think the, the message that uh, I think all of us would like you to hear loud and clear is that you are not pigeonholed by that. You're not narrowly focused because of that. You have one skill set that, uh, you know, if you've studied math or science here that you can, that you can apply to the rest of your career. But as, as we've said explicitly before, that doesn't define you. You could move into many different areas. And uh, I really think, uh, apropos of, of this last question, you should approach your ability to do that with a great deal of confidence based on the education you've received here. Any last comments from the panel? If not, let's cool off. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.